So for this next part of the talk, I'm going to describe how we can leverage time domain data to make the ROM even more uh, fast, to, 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 simulate, to simulate the ROM even faster. And I'd like to point out this is joint work with Bernard Hasdonk, uh, Lucas Brenker, and Andrea Barth. And Lucas Brenker did a lot of the really heavy lifting on the numerical experiments, especially in this, and I'd like to just acknowledge his contribution to this work. So earlier, uh, when I showed this cavity flow problem, I argued it was a very good result. We have uh, you know, the, the reduced order model generating savings of 229 times as measured in CPU hours, right? So this is really good for many query problems. And what I mean by that is many query problems, like uncertainty quantification, you can measure performance in core hours because generally the situation is as follows. I'm allocated, let's say, 100,000 or let's say 10,000 core hours on a supercomputer, and I can use that for whatever I want. So I can use that to do, uh, you know, let's say, 100 Monte Carlo simulations if that's all I can fit. So if I now am 230 times faster, that allows me to do more simulations given the same allocation. But if I care about near real-time problems where I don't necessarily care how many cores I'm using, I just want the answer as fast as possible, that's not the correct met metric to measure performance in. We should be measuring in wall time, right? Just how long does it take me to get the solution? Even if I have to throw more resources at the problem, I don't care, I just want a fast solution. And if we measure in that metric, we're much less impressive. We're generating about an order of magnitude uh, savings in wall time, which is, which is good, but it's not really enabling us to generate real-time simulations, right? And so one question is, why is this the case, right? Why is this happening? So to address this, we did a strong scaling study of our reduced order model, so we're in parallel. Strong scaling, simply we're keeping the problem size fixed, the reduced order model size fixed, and we're applying more computing cores to the problem to see how, how quick, how fast the, the, uh, the simulation progresses. So uh, the plot on the left here, measures performance in core hours. This is a different problem that's, that you can find in my thesis. Um, so in, in this exact problem, we saturate our core hour savings at around a, a value of 438 for four cores, right? Similarly, if we plot the wall time savings as a function of cores, we saturate our, our wall time savings at around a factor of seven for about 12 cores. And the reason this is happening is because recall, I'm, I'm simulating the reduced order model on a very small subset of the mesh. So it's a very small scale problem that has a very small computational footprint. So if I throw more and more computing cores at the problem, eventually the, the cost of, of synchronizing, um, performing communication, doing communication overhead, and so on, is going to outweigh the additional benefit I get in concurrency. And that's when we get this performance drop off. And this is very common for any small problems. You can only, set, you can only apply spatial parallelism so much before it saturates. And in this case, it saturates quite quickly. So that's the point of this, is that the spatial uh, parallelism is, is saturated very quickly. So what we ask ourselves is, is there any way that we can somehow widen the computational front <coughs> in a way that could allow us to improve wall time, even if it incurs additional computation? And this led us to the field of time parallel methods. So time parallel methods have been around for about 15 years or so. It really, it really pursued for the past 15 years. And the goal of these methods is to expose more parallelism to reduce wall time, even though it's going to incur additional computation. And here's how these methods work. So we take our, our this is a, sort of the fine time grid shown with small hash marks. So we're going to go from a time t0 to time t, little tm, taking, let's say, fixed time steps along the way, right? So the way that these methods work is we say that we're going to actually introduce a coarse time discretization on top of that fine time discretization with a much larger time step big H, right? So we then have two time discretization methods, and, uh, their character, and we then introduce two things. We introduce a fine propagator, which is going to advance the solution. So we're going to, the fine propagator advances a, solution, a state variable x defined at time tau1 to a future time tau2 on the fine grid. Right? So this is generally a typical time integrator, like a backward Euler or, let's say, linear multi-step or runga kutta scheme. I then have to also propose a coarse propagator that does the exact same task of advancement from time tau1 to time tau2, but it operates on the coarse time grid, right? So I have to define these two things. And if I've defined those two, then the parareal method, which is probably the most popular method for time parallelism, proceeds in a very simple way. So here's the, the equation for, time, for the parareal method. And the key thing to note, first of all, is that we have sequential coarse propagation and parallel fine propagation. So the payoff here is that the expensive step, which is the fine propagation, is done in parallel. And that's how we can actually realize computational savings. And, and, and it's hard to do because of the sequential nature of time evolution, so we only make the coarse propagator sequential. So this has been really analyzed by quite a few, uh, quite a few researchers. You can interpret the parareal method 
as a deferred residual correction scheme, multiple shooting method, a two-level multi-grid method, and so on. Um, and so the way that this method works is as follows. So we start with some initialization on the course grid. So let's say I have some initial guess, possibly by applying the course propagator with a large time step. So I initialize my solution on each course time interval, right? I then independently apply my fine propagation on each of these. So, so I, can, I can basically assign each of these course time intervals to a different processor, a different set of processors, and independently from each other, we can perform the fine propagation. Of course, because we've started with incorrect initial guesses, there's going to be some jump at these interfaces. And that's to be expected. And that's the price we pay for time parallelism, is that we have these jumps at the interfaces that we have to reduce. So these methods essentially reduce this with a Newton-like scheme. This equation is the Newton correction, and it proceeds in serial. So we start from left to right, apply this equation. We end up correcting these coarse jumps at the interfaces. At the first one, we know it's just the value of the fine propagator because we started at the right answer. And then we correct this using this equation and so on. And then we proceed with a, a par another parallel fine propagation. And so if you can convince yourself of this, then we can see that these, that these uh, jumps at the inter interfaces are going down over time. And actually, we have this nice finite termination property because, which states that this parallel, parallel in time method will, will, convert, will, will converge in at most uh, m bar iterations, where m bar is the number of time intervals we've defined. So as you might be able to tell from this cartoon, what is the critical issue in designing a time parallel method? The, 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 the fine propagator is sort of defined by our discretization method. We use a, a typical you know, high order accurate uh, time integrator. But we have a lot of leeway in terms of defining this coarse propagator, right? How do we do this? This has been the subject of a lot of research. So the critical issue is that the coarse propagator should be fast, accurate, and stable. And existing methods that have been used, the most dominant one is to simply use a typical time integrator, like backward oil or a linear multi-step scheme with a very large time step, big H, right? That's the most logical thing to do. Uh, researchers have also investigated using coarse spatial discretizations, a simplified physics model, relaxed solver tolerances, or even building reduced order models on the fly in between parallel iterations. So you can imagine in between, after each fine parallel, uh, sorry, e after each fine parallel propagation, we have data that we can use to build a reduced order model. That's what these methods do. But keep in mind, we're trying to accelerate a reduced order model itself. And what we'd like to do is, is kind of take a step back and say, hey, we actually have information we can use to generate a very good coarse propagator. And in our ROM context, in particular, we want to leverage the offline data we have that we have available from the training stage to improve the course propagator. And that's the main theme of this. So let's revisit the SVD. So if you recall from earlier in the talk, we have this snapshot matrix, let's say, taken over three different training runs. We take the SVD, and then our, our POD basis is defined by the dominant modes of U. But something, something's missing in that, in that, uh, in that construction. Namely, we, we have not used whatsoever the right singular vectors V transpose, right? We haven't used them at all. We've thrown them away. <clears throat> and why does this happen? And this is actually commonly done in the field. Um, why is this happening? And actually, let, let's first look at what does V transpose mean? So V transpose actually contains a basis for the time evolution of our generalized coordinates. So if you, could, so if you look at this, at this expression, what this is saying is that if we take the outer product viewpoint of this, this V transpose is telling me how much my first singular vector is evolving in time and parameters. Right? That's how we can interpret this V transpose matrix. And if we plot the different segments of this first row for a toy example, what we see is that my first generalized coordinate exhibits the following temporal behavior in time. Right? So th and that comes straight out of this V transpose matrix. And the way that, we, again, we interpret this is that this V transpose contains a basis for the time evolution of our solution. And this is what we're going to leverage to build a really good course propagator, because we have some knowledge of the time evolution of our solution. So we use this, uh, this V to just build a time evolution basis CJ. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to use CJ to denote a time evolution basis where the columns of CJ are, are extracted from this V transpose. So this is just a linear algebraic way of saying we take the line segments of V transpose and put them as columns into my CJ matrix. And then this defines a basis for the time evolution of the jth generalized coordinate or the jth POD mode. So we have a, an earlier paper where, where we used this uh, in, in a way to reduce the cost of each Newton solve at each iteration. So the way that this works, that, that, that this approach works, is we take that time evolution basis. Let's say we're looking at the first generalized coordinate. And I'm in some online, uh, I, I'm in some new point I've never seen before. So if you can see on the slide, 
we have three grayed out curves. This corresponds to my temporal basis, okay? And then during the online simulation, this is some new point I've never seen before, I compute the following trajectory with my reduced order model. What I can do is then look backwards in time over the previous alpha time steps, where alpha is sort of associated with the memory of the process. And then I perform least squares regression, or GAPI POD, as you saw earlier in the talk, to approximate this time evolution using my basis, right? So I'm basically placing sensors at my previous alpha time steps, measuring what my time evolution was, and then approximating, uh, approximating my time evolution using those basis vectors that I've defined. And because those, those basis vectors, it, as you recall, had global support, meaning that they're non-zero in the entire time interval, this allows me to approximate the time evolution of the solution also in the entire time interval, right? Algebraically, it comes down to this. So Z here is, is a sampling matrix similar to P before. The way you can read this is that the Z matrix, uh, so, so Z kappa beta, starts at time step kappa, and it looks backwards the previous beta time steps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at time step m minus 1, my previous time step, look backwards alpha time steps, and sample the, t the so here g denotes the time unrolling of a vector x hat j. So I'm going to unroll this, this uh, uh, the, the, the jth generalized coordinate in time, sample the previous alpha entries of it, and then I perform a least squares approximation of that time unrolled solution using my basis. Right? This gives me the generalized coordinates zj, and then I can approximate the solution in the entire time interval as c times zj, but all I really need at a given time step is the mth entry of that. So at, at time step m, I then take that forecast as the initial guess for my Newton solver. So imagine I've done this, I then have a forecast at this time step here, I can take my forecast as an init initial guess for my Newton solver. And if that initial guess is very good, then Newton's method, I'm assuming we're doing nonlinear implicit dynamics here, so we're solving, uh, the, 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 we're setting the residual to zero at each time step by applying Newton's method, the Newton's method will converge in very few iterations, possibly even zero iterations if I have a perfect forecast. So let's see how this method performs. So this is a structural dynamics example. I'm plotting here the, the reduction in the number of Newton iterations as a function of the memory for different parameters tau. Tau basically defines how often do I recompute my, my forecast. And this is showing how much my simulation speed up is improved when I apply this as a method for generating good initial guesses. And what I see is that some nice results. So we're able to reduce and, and the different curves here, this is sort of the min, the max, and, and the mean performance of the method over all the different online cases that I've tried it on. So this shows that the Newton iterations have been reduced by a factor of about two, right? So that's good. It's basically a free reduction in the number of Newton iterations. The speed up's been improved by about 50%, and I haven't lost any accuracy because I'm just using this as a way to accelerate Newton's method. Furthermore, it's fully general. I can apply it to any nonlinear ROM but I would argue it's insufficient for real-time computation. So in the earlier case when I had about a 10x speed up, this will maybe generate a 15x speed up, right? So this is good, it's free, it doesn't introduce any error, but it doesn't get us close to real time. So can we instead apply this idea for the course propagator in a time parallel setting? So the way that we do this is we take our global temporal evolution bases and we split that up into time local bases over each of those course time intervals, right? So this is, this is the course time grid that we've defined. So what we then get is a time evolution basis here, a, a time evolution basis for each generalized coordinate, that's the subscript, and each course time interval, which is the superscript. And the way that my course propagator works is as follows. I first will compute alpha time steps with the fine propagator. So I start at like the beginning of the time interval, and I apply the fine propagator for a few time steps that collects my samples of the time evolution. I then compute a local forecast within this time interval using GAPI POD. This is just the expression of the GAPI POD approximation. This is my forecast within this time interval. And I then select the very last time step as my forecast to the, as, as my propagation from the beginning to the end. So I basically computed the fine, the, 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 solved the full model for a few time steps, generated a forecast in the whole thing, and then plucked out the final entry as my, as my propagation to the end of the time interval. So I can algebraically define my course propagator as shown here. So keep in mind, this is all, all this amounts to is a vector applied to another vector. So this is a, sort of an inner product of this quantity with this quantity. So one issue that remains is how do we compute the initial seed? So the time parallel recurrence is shown here. It doesn't actually tell us how do we initialize the method, right? We can use any method we want to, to generate the initial, uh, the initial seed on, on these course time slices. And we're going to consider three of these in our numerical experiment. So we'll consider, consider a typical time integrator, so using, let's say, 
backward Euler to just advance this on a coarse time grid. This is what's often done. I'll also apply my local forecast, and then I'll finally apply a global forecast, meaning that I use my global basis in the entire time interval. I solve for a few time steps, and then I forecast in the entire thing and pluck off the entry at each of these, uh, at each of these time, interval, time intervals to, um, to initialize the method. So we have some nice, nice theoretical results as to why we think our method will work well. So let's say that uh, under, I, so th these results are for ideal conditions. So if my time unrolled solution actually lies in the range of my, of my uh, or, or the, the span of my time evolution basis for all POD modes, then our proposed method will converge in one parareal iteration, which is the minimum possible number, and it will realize the theoretical speed up of the value shown here. Um, and so I, what I, just for visualization purposes, I've shown you what, what this theoretical result looks like for different values of the memory. And you see that we're getting very close to the ideal speed ups uh, for, with our technique. And it, the, the, the critical thing to note is that most parareal methods generate speed ups on the order of four or five. So we're beating that threshold that's commonly observed by quite a bit. But the real power comes when we consider combining this in the parareal setting with using this forecast as an initial guess for the Newton solver. So let's consider further, if f is nonlinear, my time unrolled solution does lie in the range of my, of my time evolution bases, and our forecast also provides initial guesses for the Newton solver, then again we converge in one iteration because our forecast is perfect. But furthermore, we're only going to compute alpha nonlinear, we're only going to solve alpha nonlinear systems of algebraic equations in each time interval because we're going to solve those first alpha, and then because we're using it as an initial guess for the Newton solver, um, each each forecast will be perfect, and I'll just evaluate the residual and move on. I'm not going to do any solves anymore because I'm going to be able to detect that my forecast was perfect just by evaluating the residual. So we get this alternative version for the speed up, um, where tau here is tau r is the ratio of evaluating a residual to solving an entire system of nonlinear algebraic equations. So this, for the sake of argument, we'll say this is about, let's say, one tenth. So if I make that assumption then I can generate these, these plots that visualize that theoretical speedup result. So ideal speedup is shown with this dashed line, and you see that by leveraging time domain data, we're able to generate far better than ideal speedup results with this technique, theoretically. Right? So this is, uh, this is showing that we're getting uh, speedups on the order of about 100 or almost 120 when we're using only 15 processors. And this is really an exciting result because this shows that we can get very close to near real-time computations with reduced order models under certain conditions. So if we apply this result to our previous example, we, we go then from 10x faster to now 1,000x faster under these ideal conditions. So this lends credence into the idea that our method is, is, is possibly you know, quite powerful for these techniques. Furthermore, we can prove that our method is stable if the fine propagator is stable. And this is not a surprising result because our coarse propagator is simply a linear operator that acts on the fine propagator, right? Just a vector multiplied by the fine propagator evaluated at a few time steps. So what this statement is saying is that if our fine propagator is stable, meaning that uh, if we propagate from time tau to time tau plus delta t, and that doesn't grow faster than, 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 than the, the quantity shown on the right here, then our proposed method is stable in the following sense, meaning that our solution can't grow faster than exponentially in time. Where cm is this quantity, we have these results here. So this will be appearing in our paper that's going to be out very shortly. So I'll now show you how this works on the Invisa Burgers equation I showed earlier. So now I'm actually going to introduce a parameterization to this Burgers equation. Uh, so I've introduced mu1, which is just the left boundary condition on the, on the problem, and also mu2, which defines this, this forcing term. Uh, we'll, we'll define this parameter uh, domain for the, for the problem. Here are the parameters of, 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 the, of, of the experiments. N equals 5,000, number of times, not number of times, it's number of degrees of freedom. We're going to use the LSPG ROM with a POD basis of dimension 100. We'll use four training points and then use our method at some new random online point. I'll consider two coarse propagators and three initial seeds, as I mentioned. So let's first look at the global temporal bases for this problem. So I'm looking at the global basis for POD mode 1, 5, 10, and 100. And the obvious thing to note here is that the, the lower index POD modes behave much more smoothly in time and have a longer wavelength response, right? In contrast, if we go up to the higher index POD modes, we get a very noisy response that has a very, very small wavelength that's almost smaller than the discretization of, of, than the fine discretization that we've employed. So what this shows us right away is that the higher index generalized coordinates are not even forecastable. Because if I'm going to try to simulate for a few time steps and then forecast with this very noisy basis, 
it's probably going to produce very poor results because I'm basically forecasting some noisy signal that doesn't have any predictive capability outside of a very short time window. Um, and furthermore, if we adopt the, 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 the multi-grid perspective of parareal methods, multi-grid basically states that at coarser grids, you should be trying to, trying to, to reduce long wavelength errors. So we have really no business trying to reduce high, uh, short wavelength errors when we go to the, to, to the coarse grid. And I'll show that really quickly right now. So let's plot the time parallel error as a function of time parallel iteration when we forecast one POD mode, the first five, the first 10, the first 15, the first 20, and the first 100. So the obvious thing to note here is that we have some benefit by increasing more and more, by, by forecasting more and more modes up to a certain point. Then when we start more, uh, forecasting the noisy modes, our performance degrades to the point where it actually blows up almost to 10 to the minus 10 to the 12. So this really shows that we can't, that we should only be forecasting the low energy POD modes, which makes sense intuitively. So the rest of the results, I'm going to proceed by forecasting the first 10 POD modes, first 10 POD coordinates. So what this plot shows is the time parallel error as a function of the time parallel iteration. The blue curves correspond to an initial seed provided by the local forecast. The black curves were the initial seed uh, that's provided by backward Euler. And the red curves were the initial seeds provided by a global forecast. So the first thing, and, and the solid curves correspond to a backward Euler propagator and the dash curve corresponds to a local forecast propagator. So the first thing to note is that the best performance by far is, is achieved by using the global forecast as an initialization, right? We're, we're reducing the error from the normal, so the typical method is a solid black line. We're decreasing the initial error from, of the typical method by almost two orders of magnitude just by using that initial guess. And the worst performance is for the local forecast because essentially we, we end up getting error accumulation if we're just forecasting for the initial guess when we do it locally. All the little errors that we do kind of accumulate in time. However, if we use the local forecast as a coarse propagator, not as an initialization method, it always outperforms backward Euler in every case. So what this shows is that forecasting improves both the initial seed if we do it globally and the coarse propagator if we do it locally. So that's the best combination of methods. So our, the best method is clearly this dashed line, which is a global forecast initialization and a local forecast uh, course propagation. To give you some intuition into how this method progresses, I'm now going to show you uh, the, the, the black curves here and the red curves here uh, in, in a different way. So we're going to visualize those same simulations in a different way. So this top row here corresponds to a backward Euler seed. That's basically the, these black curves. And the bottom row here corresponds to a global forecast initial seed, which are, which are these red curves here. And so what we see when we use backward Euler as the propagator and as the initial seed, we start off with some, so I'm visualizing the state variable as a function of time for different parareal iterations. So we see that parareal starts off with a very bad approximation. That's this curve here that's very jagged and not close to the real solution. And it very slowly refines it and improves it until eventually we get to the right answer. If we use the same initialization, so we start off quite bad with the backward Euler, using a local forecast, we're able to refine the, the, the solution much more rapidly and converge much more quickly to the answer. So that associates with this dashed black curve here, where we're able to, to reduce the solution quite a bit more quickly than the, other, than, than the other method. Similarly, if we look at the global forecast, we see that we start off with almost the exact correct initial guess. Right? This is almost indistinguishable from the real answer. But the backward Euler method takes a little longer to resolve these little discrepancies, whereas the local forecast method resolves them almost immediately. And that corresponds to comparing the solid red line with, with, a, with a dashed red line. If we consider how well these methods perform in, in parallel, so I'm using a 10 to the minus 3 convergence criterion for this result. So the number of parareal iterations is a function of number of processors. The worst case scenario for parareal is that it converges in the number of, of uh, course intervals we have, which is equal to the number of processors. So we see that backward Euler actually exhibits worst case performance almost always until we get to a large number of processors. And the reason that's the case is because when we add many course intervals, our course time step is going down and down and down. So eventually we get close to the range of convergence for backward Euler and it starts to work better. In contrast, our method always converges in only one parareal iteration, even in this predictive case. So that shows that we're always beating backward Euler by a significant amount, and in fact, we're enjoying the optimal parareal performance, which is hopefully going to lead us to near real-time computations with our reduced model when we implement it in our HPC codes. So that's really the next step of this research. So the conclusion is we use temporal data to reduce the ROM simulation time. Offline, we obtain these time evolution bases for free from the right singular vectors. 
Then online, we recommend using the global forecast as an initial seed and then the local forecast as the course propagator. We had theoretical results that implied very good stability and, or stability and very good speed up. We observed and practiced ideal perireal performance and a huge perform improvement over the standard method of using backward oiler for both the course propagator and initialization. And furthermore, we introduced no additional error. There's not an approximation that we're introducing. It's merely an acceleration mechanism. So we have our former paper where we use it as the initial guess shown here. And then we're working on a paper that should be out very shortly uh, on the time parallel variant of this.